I don't know anyone that doesn't believe in macro evolution. It's kind of weird that this flood would like churn up the whole world, lay down all these layers all over the place, but only leave fossils of kangaroos in Australia. And that just happens to be where the kangaroos go back to after the flood. That's an awful lot of history to pack into just a few hundred years. Hello everyone, today we have Joel Duff on the line today. He is a professor of biology at the University of Akron. He has a PhD in botany. He has a YouTube channel, blog, and he goes to creation museums for fun. Joel, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great, Zach. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. So today we're gonna to be talking about creation versus evolution, specifically on how much animals have changed after the flood. Now, uh, before we really get into it, I wanna talk about some terms and like, you know, what your beliefs are. So we can general idea of what we're gonna be talking about. So young earth creationists believe there's basically two views. So you have macro and micro evolution. Younger creationists believe in microevolution, but not macro. Joel, what are your beliefs, and uh, can you tell us the difference between the two? <laughs> wow. Okay, that's a huge question. Okay. And um, so I'm going to start by saying um, that let's ask the question: What is macroevolution? Because as you as you said, young earth creationists will say we don't believe in macroevolution, but we believe in microevolution. And evolutionary biologists are, I guess, known for believing in both, right? Mm -hmm. And so when somebody asks me, do you believe in macroevolution? I always have to stop and say, well, what, what exactly it is that you mean by the word macroevolution? Um, so first, microevolution um, for your audience. If, if I were teaching an uh, evolutionary biology class or I were uh, really even teaching a general biology class and we were discuss evolutionary biology, and I might define that word microevolution, I'm going to say that's a, a change in allele frequencies uh, in populations over time. And you're like, allele frequencies, what's that? Well, just think of that as it's a change in different variants of genes that make slightly different traits um, where the population changes over time. So think like, you know, eye color or something like that. There, you know, the, the, the number of people with blue eyes might change over time versus brown eyes. And you can think of any character in any population of other of individuals of any population of species and they are changing over time with respect to their genetics and the and the frequency of the different uh, variants in that population so that's what we call micro evolution because it's it's changes on small scales that are happening every single generation so what then is macro evolution well in a in, from, a, from an evolutionary biology or evolutionary theory context, macroevolution is usually understand, understood as um, many, a, a lot of microevolution or many changes that, it, that it accumulate to the point where you actually drive two populations to be separated enough that you would look at them, you go like, hey, those aren't really the same thing anymore. Those are two different species. And when you start talking about species forming from what had been a population of individuals that you all called the same thing before, um, at that point, we start talking about macroevolution. There's really no dividing line exactly, but macroevolution then is species becoming other species. So with that definition in mind, I'm going to, here's my answer, that my, my first answer. And my first answer is that I don't know anyone that doesn't believe in macroevolution based on the definition I just gave you. So you're like, no, oh, that's not very exciting because, of course, that's not what you or maybe your audience is thinking when they're asking the question, do you believe in macroevolution? Because if, if somebody asks that question, usually what they're saying is, do you believe that pond scum became human beings, right? They're thinking of like that, that grand scale of changes from one type of organism to another type of organism over time. Um, but even just changes from one species to another is is by definition macroevolution. So I, I only point that out to say that it's sort of everybody. I, I suppose there's rare, uh, you know, individuals that don't believe in speciation. But even young Earth creationists, as I think we're going to talk about, um, you know, believe in quite a bit of speciation that one species can give rise to multiple different species. And for me, I say yes, they believe in macroevolution. That that macroevolution can happen. So then the question becomes not does somebody believe or accept that macroevolution can happen? It's really the question of how much macroevolution do you think 
is possible. That's actually the, like the, uh, and I'm not critiquing your question because this is the question that I think you've asked it just how most people would ask it. But if I were to say, here's how to better ask that question for uh, say a scientist, um, you would say, how much macroevolution are you willing to accept? And then that gets to the question of, do you think that single cells could actually change into multicellular organisms and change into a variety of different organisms uh, on the face of the earth? So young earth creationists, they're willing to accept that like two dogs, you know, two canines were on Noah's Ark. And then after they got off, they then changed into or diversified into 50 different, well, there's like 36 different living species of canines today, which if you include the foxes, um, but there's also another 30 or 40 different extinct species of canines as well. And all of those we, we say are in a family of organisms because they're kind of similar to each other. But any evolutionary biologist would say that the change from one species of canine to all those different species is macroevolution. It's it is the change of organisms into different sorts of organisms or different species over time. Um, yeah, so, you know, am I a macroevolutionist? I mean, yeah. So I, I think that macroevolutionary patterns are real phenomena and that we have plenty of evidence from, a, from fossil record and from genetic evidence or genomic evidence that organisms are connected to each other uh, via historical connections we call common ancestors. And with respect to the larger question, I'm not trying to skirt the big question, right, of like macro, macro, macro evolution, like, you know, big, big scale uh, evolution. It, how would I answer, how would I answer the question of like macro evolution in the way that most people think of it is, is that I, I would say that evolutionary theory provides a really robust and powerful framework for understanding the origin of biological diversity. Um, it's the best scientific theory that we have to explain how organisms, it, to explain both the observations of the fossil record, being that there are simple organisms at the bottom of the fossil record and more complex and more diverse organisms at the top of the fossil record, but also explains the, the interesting similarities in the genomes between different organisms as well. So evolutionary theory provides, just like all scientific theories are what they're intend to do is provide an explanatory framework for the observations we make in the world, whether it's laws of how the, uh, you know, how gases move around and interact at different temperatures. Um, this is, you know, how do organisms interact with each other and their environment and how do they adapt to their environment? And potentially as environments change over long periods of time, how do they adapt and speciate into those environments? So that said, I said that I, I don't see another scientific theory that does a better job of explaining the observations. It's a powerful, you know, it, it's a powerful, like I said, framework for understanding the evidence around us. Um, sure, there are other there are other frameworks, I guess you could say, right? There's intelligent design and there's progressive creationism, which are different variants of under there are different ideas about how to understand why there's different variation in the world. But both of those theories still accept that the world is very, very old. They simply find they would say that they see kinks or in the the evolutionary mechanisms that don't provide for the, the full ability to make all that variation from small cells all the way up to complex organisms, and they would insert in that case, you know, or assert that um, that God has intervened in different ways or progressively created different organisms so they don't have connections. Um, and I'm open to those ideas. I don't exclude those ideas. I mean, I'm a Christian. I believe God can do can do whatever he wants, right? He has the power to to do that. Um, but just speaking from a like from an evidentiary standpoint, I don't I don't have any problem with evolutionary theory as a potential explanation for life's changes on Earth over time. But I think we'll we'll touch on some other topics that relate to that. So I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that uh, are like, everyone's in macroevolutionist. What are you talking about? So, so <laughs> Everybody we're gonna, we're is. Gonna, they really are. It's we're just gonna a get question into of where do you stop? 
it's just yeah. a question of where do you stop yeah everyone has a limit like i i will go to like these five species have a common ancestor therefore they evolve from a common ancestor but i don't think these two things have a common ancestor and you can talk to 20 different young earth creationists and get 20 different answers about well oh, that's macro evolution oh but that's not a macro evolution um, that's micro evolution uh, because they define microevolution as broader than what normal evolutionary biologists do. They, they think that speciation is microevolution. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, as we're going to learn, uh, as, we're, as we continue to talk about it, you know, maybe they might not be on board with the whole macroevolution. But at some point, it gets to the level of where it's, you see almost like a blending of the lines. And the question is, how far are you, how, yeah, as you said, how far are you willing to go in that? Yeah, and, and the question is kind of like, at what point does it make you step over a line where you say, look, I have, you know, I have an interpretation of the scriptures, which I hold at a higher, you know, value uh, compared to our, our, our earthly, our physical opera, uh, um, let's say that one, our observations we make as human beings. And maybe there's, there's a point where, uh, you know, I am very clear that the Bible says this about the world and how it operates and if this theory suggests something else or that these two things have common ancestors and the bible says they don't well then i'm gonna i have to go with the bible um but i think we'll hit upon that again a little bit later as well sure all right so as someone who is a macro macro <laughs> yeah, macro yeah uh uh and you went to school to be taught macro macro evolution my question for you is, how do you know you weren't brainwashed? How <laughs> I know I wasn't brainwashed? Um, yeah. Well, you know, first of all, um, you know, I didn't really go to college to be sort of taught evolutionary theory, or or it wasn't like my intent. Like I want to be an evolutionary biologist. In fact, I don't. I I consider myself as knowledgeable about evolutionary biology, and I would have to interact with evolutionary biology because virtually every biologist does really, uh, in some sense, it it touches upon what they do. Um, but I'm not like a trained evolutionary biologist in the in the sense of like, oh, that's my area of interest where I'm, I'm an evolutionary biologist first and then some other kind of biologist second. But if I go back and I think about how did I become interested in science, um, I grew up in Colorado and, and there I lived at the edge of town and I had fossils around me. I was really interested in outdoors things. My dad, my father was as well. My father is a, a, um, a pastor in a, a reformed church. And uh, so I grew up uh, in the church, still am in the church. And he, um, you know, I would say, I would say he was an old earth creationist in a sense, or he is an old earth creationist in that he never had a problem with the age of the earth. Hmm. Uh, and so, it wasn't something that we like talked about. I wasn't like that in tune with young earth creationists at that time because that wasn't part of what we talked about. Um, and I went off to Calvin College, and um, which is a Christian college up in Michigan, and I wanted to be a physicist. Um, and I wanted to be either an atom smasher or an astronomer, right? You gotta go like go really big, like understand the whole universe or like understand everything at the smallest component. And of course, anyone who studies those areas is like, you can't avoid thinking about the big questions, right? Of, of the universe and history and, and all these things. So I was interested in those questions. And then I went to, so I found out very quickly that I'm not good, at, good enough at math to be a physicist or an astronomer, right? Because I didn't realize that it's just math. All right, so I was like, I can't do this, but you know, I love science. And so I ended up in biology. Um, and from, from there, even in college, like at Calvin College, we, I learned about evolutionary theory, but I didn't learn about, uh, you know, I don't remember really being, you know, pushed very hard on different ideas. Uh, and it wasn't until I went to graduate school that I really started to think about science and faith and really start to really think about this and was exposed to young earth creationism because I went to a church that was young earth creationists and they're kind of exposing me to that. Oh, but your original question was, how do you know you're not being brainwashed? And I, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is that, you know, brainwashing to me is when I think about somebody who, who can't 
consider other options because they only know one option and they feel like they they uh, that that's the truth or it must be the truth and they don't want to they don't want to risk that truth by trying to understand other options out there but when you grow up in a situation where you're experiencing all different sorts of views then you don't have to worry so much about being trapped into like oh am i really right about this because i've asked that question myself i think everybody should ask their, that question of themselves i think it's a healthy thing to do ask yourself am i just believing this because the people around me have just sort of made me think this is the way i should think and then i reconfirm those thoughts by constantly ingesting the same material to reconfirm that because we all we all want to feel like we're right about something um and you know our age of social media doesn't really help with that because we tend to follow people that we kind of, you know, already have thoughts like we do, right? That's the brainwashing cycle. And so, you know, my my advice is to is to be force yourself to be around people that will actually ask hard questions. Right? I just doing interviews like this is a hard thing to do because it makes you it makes you really think about like, well, what do I really believe and how do I actually express that? And then you're challenged by that. And it's in that challenging process that I would say you're refining your ideas. And so I've gone all over the board in terms of like, oh, I, I, you know, that really sounds like a great idea. Oh, I, I never really thought about it that way. And it's taken, it's like a 20 year journey. And um, having gone through that journey, I can say that I've explored lots of different options and taken different options seriously because I have good friends and have relationships with people that have very different views than I do. And when you have that, you're able to you're able to interact in a way that forces you to say, "Do I really know what I believe?" Um, and that's that to me is a protection, and to be able to say, "Yeah, I'm not just brainwashed." It's not like went to the secular university. Well, I went to a Christian college, but I went to a secular university for graduate school, and it's like, "Oh, you've just been fed all this stuff, and you just you know you just sucked it in and said, "Yeah, I'm going to believe that." Um, but if you're properly prepared, with the ability to think critically and to expose yourself to different ideas, then you're you're ready to like start making some more difficult decisions about what it is you believe and why. So on that question, so you talked about like some ideas of, of what what we can do to make sure that you know we're not like brainwashing our or just like feeding ourselves one side of a conversation. Yeah. Uh, on the same on the same topic, wouldn't someone that is brainwashed say they aren't brainwashed? So like, how do you know you're not brainwashed? And when when <laughs> you someone that's brainwashed think that they are not brainwashed? Yeah, doesn't everyone? Doesn't everyone? I I would hope that everyone at some point wakes up one day and thinks, "Is this the real world? Or am I just living in a dream?" You know, it's like I mean, isn't that you know? How do you know you're just you haven't just become a character? caricature of yourself mm -hmm. and that you just want to confirm what you believe and so you surround yourself and only give yourself information that reaffirms your own beliefs um yeah how do uh, how do you know that you're not well i i think it's mostly what i just said before but and i've lost track of the question now so you have to repeat it <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> i talk myself in a circle <laughs> Uh, when, when someone that's brainwashed say they aren't brainwashed. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Don't we see that all the time in YouTube comments and uh, yeah, on right. Twitter? I mean, you cannot. There are some people you just cannot convince that you, it doesn't matter what data you provide. Now, they, usually, that's a sign that you're you're brainwashed, hmm. right? It's a, I think brainwashed is kind of a pejorative term, but that's a sign that. If you are, if somebody honestly is trying to give you information um, to help you understand something, and you just persist in not listening to that and then regurgitating the same idea again over and over and over again, well, then chances are that you you have <laughs> you've reached that point where, where you're unreachable uh, in that sense, and that you your mind has convinced you of the truth of it, and there's really nothing that can break that. And that right, that's where conspiracy theories come in because mm -hmm. your mind will make up a conspiracy about why whatever it is you hear you shouldn't listen to. And isn't that I mean, uh, saying as a scientist, I'll say that that's one of the powerful. That's the one of the things that science should do. Like 
even at Christian worldview, a proper understanding of science should be that there is a reality to this world. You know, this is, we're not living in a fake world. You know, God created this world and he created it with rules and he created it with reason and rationality and how it operates because, because it's part of his character, right? And science done right is allows a person to say, there's all these ideas out here about how this works or, you know, does vitamin D actually help me, you know, avoid COVID or something or does hydroxychloroquine, yeah, I can never say that. HQ actually, you know, prevent COVID or something like that, right? Those are the popular things of the day. But you can think of a hundred questions that, that people fight about. And you say, but there is this method that will allow you to take your emotions out of the question. Like, I think this is true because hmm. somebody told me or I saw somebody and they took a bunch of the stuff and it worked for them. So therefore, I just believe it works. But when you say the word believe, it's like, well, what's that belief based on? I mean, it's not the scriptures. Scripture doesn't tell you whether vitamin D works or not, right? It's, it's, you're just getting, you're just coming up with ideas and beliefs based on hearsay or, or all kinds of things. And what science does is it allows you to say, well, there is this method that you can kind of more dispassionately say, is there a way to test whether this product actually does what people says it does, right? And that's, a clinical trial where you're 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 going to collect you're going to examine multiple people you're going to you're going to have a study group and a control group and at the end you're going to have some data and it's going to say wow this thing you know it really does do this or there's a significant chance that it really doesn't do this and hopefully if you are a reasonable person you will be able to look at that data and say okay i know that i believe this or i wanted to believe this but there is any evidence to support my idea, right? Uh, support my prior belief. And so I've got to be willing to change what I believe because I don't have any evidence to support that. Um, and so that's where the whole, you know, so the, so the brainwashing thing is when people become so convinced of an idea that no evidence can change their mind, um, then chances are that nothing can change your mind. That, and I would go to the point where even scriptures won't change your mind because you've somehow convinced yourself of some particular truth. And we see lots of different um, heretical teachings out there that gather a following, even though they don't have, you know, support. Oh, yeah. It's just that you get an idea ingrained in people's mind. That to me is the value of something like systematic theology, which I know some people don't like systematic theology is systematically going through scriptures and doing the different kinds of studies to be able to a little bit more dispassionately say, what does this really mean in context uh, of with the rest of scriptures? Hmm. Hmm. Very fascinating. All right, cool. So um, kind of on that topic, um, so Anders and Zinnerses and Ken Ham talk about the idea of starting with two points. Ultimately, uh, Ken Ham says this. He says, ultimately, there are only two religions in the world. One is based on God's word, the Bible, and the other is based on man's word. As I think we would both agree, but maybe not, that the Bible doesn't teach evolution. The ancient Israelite would have had no idea what evolution was. So if you aren't starting with the Bible, does that mean you are starting with man's word? Well, I certainly hope I'm not starting with man's word. I mean, man's word is not very trustworthy in many situations. Um, no, but I, I think we do agree that the Bible doesn't teach evolution. And I, I kind of I kind of cringe when I hear people trying to find verses mm -hmm. or say that, oh, look here, it's talking about this this animal and, and how it's how it changes with. I, I don't know. I can't think of the verse now, but there's several places where people will try to see yep. evolution in scriptures. And I kind of like. You know, even if evolutionary biology is true, and I, like I already said, I think it's a pretty good framework for understanding biological variation, but that doesn't mean that the Bible has to speak to that particular topic. I think if it does speak to the topic of a, you know, if the authors intended to tell us something about how organisms evolved over time, then if they mentioned it, then it would absolutely be true. However, I don't, I don't think that that was on the minds of the, the authors of scripture, which ultimately is on the mind of God, who's communicating um, through um, his human agents, right? Who are, who are uh, composing uh, scriptures. Um, so 
and if you think, if you go back to the ancient world, really, no one in that time, you know, if you lived back then, very different today where there weren't, you know, there weren't any atheists. Everyone believed in gods. Everyone believed that there were higher powers. Um, but they weren't really interested, as far as we can tell from most writings, not really interested in like the age of the earth or like exactly what the mechanisms of like the physical, like makeup of how things were made. It's all about why is the world, you know, the way the world is, you know, who it is that made this world. And that's Genesis one and two is, is all about like, who is this God? It's the only God. And it is the God that has the ability to form and make all things. Um, but it's really about the purpose of creation. Like, why did I make this creation? And why am I communicating? You know, what do I want to communicate to those who are following me? What they need to know about who I am and my purpose in creation. Um, and so, you know, the so yeah, the, I don't think the Bible teaches evolution. On the other hand, it doesn't teach. I don't believe it teaches that the, the specific age of the Earth either. Young Earth creationists infer from scriptures that one, you know, an interpretation that the Earth may be young because of a particular interpretation. But um, I think that's also not on the mind of the author of the of the Bible. Um, and so that's it's forcing it into the Bible. And I wouldn't want to force evolutionary biology into the text either. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'm all for reading the text as ancient Israelite would have read it. Um, so yeah, continuing. Um, so something that you've talked about in some of your videos is the idea that there's actually a lot of debate among younger creationists about uh, how species have changed and how you have these kinds and like what classifies as a kind, which of course that's a whole different topic. But like you talk about like there's a whole lot of debate of a, a different uh, speciation and like microevolution and like some people think that's actually macroevolution and all the how all that works so could you briefly talk or briefly talk about that yeah <laughs> yeah brief for me is is tough um so yeah well first of all let's think about let's think about uh, a global flood in a young earth creationist uh, model of the history of the world um, you're bringing all the kinds uh, on board two of every kind or seven of the clean animals Okay. And of those, first of all, we have to remember that kinds are just the vertebrate land animals. So not every single species on the face of the earth, but only the vertebrate land animals. But even if you think about the number of vertebrate land animals, because um, that would include dinosaurs, and there's like 500 different species of dinosaurs, and there's like 500 different species of pterosaurs, and there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of extinct groups of organisms. Um, but in the Young Earth Creations model, they all had to be on the ark because they don't believe that there was extinction of different kinds before the flood. Mm. Um, and, and that's really not clear to me why they believe that must be the case, but they just sort of assume that's the case. And I'll say assume mm. because what they say is that Noah said, Noah was told by God to bring two of every kind. And what they take the word every kind to mean is every kind he created. Mm -hmm. And if he created those in the beginning, they must still be present. And so Noah's taking those on board. So if you add up the number of different species, well, that's going to be, you know, it's, it's 100,000, 200,000 or more, probably a lot more if species of vertebrate land animals, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And that's just not going to fit on the ark. And even young earth creationists recognize that. So there is this idea of a kind, though, as more than just a species. It's it's a group of organisms that uh, would represent, or a group of species alive today, but was represented by like a proto version of those species in the beginning, and that's the, the original kinds. And so all that needed to be on board was two representatives of that group. And if you take the group to be like, hey, all canines or all bears are a kind, well, then you only need two bears. You don't need two polar bears and two grizzly bears and two black bears and two sun bears. And all right, you don't need all those different species. You only need the two bears. Well, even if you get all the different bears, well, sorry, all the different uh, kinds together, 
they would say that that's like 1400 different kinds on the ark. But today, you know, what do we have around us today? Yeah, you know, they're not 1400 different species of animals. There's uh, of land animals, there's 100,000 different land animals. There's 10,000 different birds. There's 15,000 different mammal species. There's 20,000 different reptiles and amphibian species. So the question then becomes, where did all those species come from, right? If they all started as just two individuals or seven individuals, and there was only 1,400 of them, and now you've got 100,000 of them, um, that suggests that there had to have been a massive something had to you know a lot of change had to happen right between the ark and today which is only 4350 years give or take a couple of years and so they have to they then propose that after the original pairs stepped off the ark and reproduced that they then diversified fancy word for speciate right they speciated into multiple different species so there are some groups of birds that they propose that two birds got off the ark and became 150 different species which are now present in all different parts of the world um so that is a okay i'll just say it it's that is a lot of evolution <laughs> it's like because I, I defined at the beginning that's macroevolution and although they'll call that microevolution it's incredibly fast microevolution if they want to call it microevolution um, i'll just say that any evolutionary biologist who hears or i ever talk to about this rate of evolution that they propose it sends their head spinning because they just can't believe that that any species could evolve that fast in other words it's it's like evolution beyond the wildest dreams of any evolutionist in terms of what you know how much change could actually happen over a short period of time and so that's where that's where young earth creationists in general is today is that they are proposing what i call hyper rapid speciation or hyper speciation or hyper evolution there's a variety of different terms for it of species uh, after the flood i do want to point out one interesting little sidelight to this because um, i think it's important to think about and that is on the ark i just said there was say you know 1400 kinds on the ark so i've i've looked at that list at the ark encounter and i've i've got that list of all the the kinds they say were present there and they would say there's like 45 different kinds of dinosaurs you have 500 species of dinosaurs but they're lumped together like some of the tyrannosaurids or something like that are all together as a kind but if you think about all those kinds and i've added them up and i've looked at the list and i've said how many of them are extinct today like how many of those kinds exist today obviously we don't have pterosaurs and we don't have uh, we don't have th something called synapsids which there were lots of in the past and we don't have dinosaurs and we don't have there's even some mammal groups we don't have today and if you add it up 55 percent of all the kinds listed in the ark encounter as being on noah's ark are extinct today they don't they don't exist in today's environment uh and so i find that rather i i find that i find that really interesting to think about because it's it's saying that in their model god helped god created 1400 different kinds of vertebrates vertebrate animals and then preserved them for 15 1600 years to the flood and then even though he destroyed in their model you know, like all the individuals except for two of them after they got off the ark they went extinct right they, they just they disappear and that's more than half of the diversity of earth so i i like to think of it that way because i'm always telling my students you look outside it's like amazing like like the world around us is incredible in terms of the number mm -hmm. of different sorts of living things i mean there's millions of species on earth today um and it's really amazing to think that half of that diversity in the young earth creationist model like half more than half of it is completely gone entire kind that's not mm. that's like saying if you were to say like tomorrow there's going to be no more canines like no more dogs no more wolves no more coyotes no more foxes no more like that whole group is just going to be gone um that would be a pretty astounding amount of diversity loss um and that's sort of what the young earth creationist model does it says that we've lost we've lost most of the diver well, not most half of the diversity that god created is gone doesn't exist for us today um now they they would say that's because of degradation genetic entropy they have various reasons for why that's happening i just find it kind of a depressing view of the history 
of God's creation that that everything is that everything is you know, we we've lost so much um, through time. Yeah, uh, but I think I uh, got lost uh, somewhere along the way here in terms of your question. Uh, I want to, to so I want to clarify. So just to be, just to be clear. So basically, it sounds like you're saying it seems like a very depressing thing for God to create all of this and then it die off so quickly after we have so much, you know, existence left. And then not only that, but God created it all. Then he saved a bunch from dying and then they all died very quickly. And it's kind of like questions like, okay, it seems kind of odd why God would do that. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yeah. I, 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 I don't think these are monumental questions, but I mm -hmm. think it's worth pondering in, in that matter why why God preserved kinds to the flood. And then essentially, even though he preserved them through the flood, right? You know, you would say that Noah preserved all the different kinds through the flood, but then it didn't do any good because immediately after the flood, they went extinct. Um, it kind of makes you want, it, it just, that's something that is a question for that model. They need to have an answer for the, the overall trajectory of, of why, why life looks like it does in their model hmm. starting out with x amount of diversity continuing x amount of diversity continuing on through time and then a drastic drop and then honestly from that time you've had some new species right you had, you had 1400 essential species on the ark and then eventually it turns into thousands that are alive today but at the same time we know that species are going extinct today and the trajectory would be that we would lose most of those species in the young earth creationist model. So I don't know what your eschatology, eschatological views are, and we're not going to get into that, but it's interesting. The, the young earth creationist eschatology is interesting because essentially most of them believe the world is running down at such a fast pace that there won't be many species or diversity left within the next, hmm. you know, 500 to a thousand years, because if genomes are decaying and nothing is, because they don't believe that new information can form. They don't believe that any new true adaptions can really be generated. That's a big difference between young earth creationist views of microevolution and, and what we'll call, now we'll call it macroevolution. Macroevolution really does require that organisms and genomes actually obtain significant changes to their structure such that they can actually have new properties, new characteristics. They can evolve new traits. And young earth creationists say that new traits can't evolve and therefore they can only decay. They can only fall apart. They can only be lost. And if you just run that forward a little while, what do you think is going to happen? You know, if, if you can never generate anything new because God's mm. creation is done, right? You know, they say that creation is absolutely done after, at the sixth day. So God is not allowed to add anything new this whole time. That, that's another aspect of young earth creationists and their worldview that I that I kind of cringe at too. Although I'm a scientist, I don't want to exclude God from actually interacting with his creation uh, at any point if he were so to desire to. Um, but in the young earth creationist view, everything is is on a decline, you know, and it can't get itself up at all. There's, there can be no improvement. And therefore the world truly is running down. Uh, and, and, that, and that's why most of them would believe that the world is not you know, going to be around a whole lot longer. Um, and have a generally pessimistic view of the future yeah. Um, because there's, there is no optimism. The only optimism is that we're going to be taken out of this world one way or the other and elevated into, you know, into heaven, which is certainly a wonderful end point, but it doesn't result, boy, I'm going way off on a tangent compared to where we were going to go, but it, it doesn't allow many younger, I'm not going to say all, I'll say many young earth creationists can't really enjoy this world or think about working about make working to make this world better, hmm. right? To, to, it doesn't allow them to really think about what their work is here and now. I mean, after all, God created this world and gave Adam and Eve tasks. And those tasks aren't, although we are in, inhibited from being, doing them correctly, right? I mean, it, the fall has inhibited our ability to truly do the work that God gave us, but it doesn't mean we are not supposed to be doing it. And we're, we are supposed to be keeping this world, tending to this world. And I would go further and say that we are ordering this world, right? We, we took 
God took the original chaos and made the garden, put Adam and Eve in it. But the rest of the world wasn't necessarily this fantastic garden. And had Adam and Eve obeyed, they should have expanded the boundaries of that of that garden to cover the whole earth. And that's the picture in Revelation. That's the picture in Ezekiel. That's you know we we see that imagery of of the 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 garden uh, of covering the whole earth. And Adam and Eve failed at that job, um, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a reason why we're here now, and we don't we're not supposed to be working toward making his kingdom a better place um, and achieve and achieving at least some sense of what the original plan was. And it's too easy. And I think in younger creationist models, sometimes to sit back and say like the world's running down places get, you know, it's everything's going to hell in a handbasket, right. And society is decaying and we just kind of like shut ourselves off from it. And we just like hunker down and we're just waiting for Christ to return. Um, and it's it's a very different mindset toward toward the world around us. All right, sorry that was a that was a bit of a tangent, but there's just some things I've been thinking about a lot lately. Yeah. Well, it, that made me uh, think about the idea of um, recently in the past 100 years, there's been a, a resurgence. Well, even maybe the start of like you know you got like left behind and all that. Yeah, and it's like oh it's the end of the world, but then you've also had a uh, like a resurgence or, or even a start, depending on how you look at it, of young creationism. So it's, it's an interesting parallel there that I never thought about. Yeah, I don't know what that that, that dispensationalistic sort of view and how that how that interacts with the beginnings of young earth creationism. I'm not, I'm not really sure what the connections are there, how strong those connections are. But yeah, that's there is definitely a there's not a direct connection. There is there's no. a connection in sort of like uh, ment mentality about it. So you act kind of like a general overview of like different issues that pertain to how the you have flood and species on the ark and all that kind of stuff and speciation afterwards and death after after the ark and all that kind of stuff. But can you get into specifics as far as uh, as some some specific problems on this issue? Yeah. So so again, we, I started before by saying if we think about the, the model of a global flood and and that's a I think of it as like a bottleneck right it's a bottleneck for all life well all vertebrate life on earth they have to go through that bottleneck they start out at creation there's populations presumably large populations develop on earth and then they get constricted into this very small number on the ark and then they're going to rebound and if you think about that rebound well you know Noah steps out with his family after uh, on on the mountains of Ararat, and he looks around, and the world would be completely devastated, right? And there's no animals on it. There's no, you know, well, there'd be some plants that are beginning to come back, but it's a devastated world. And then the animals are only in one place in the world at that point, right? The kangaroos are only in one place. The zebras are only in one place. The canines are in one place, and the human beings are only in one place on the uh, at one point on the earth and today they're everywhere right they're, they've covered the face of the earth uh and so one of the things that the the young earth creationist model needs to do is to be able to explain how organisms got from the ark out to various places uh in the world and so let's you think about something like lemurs Right, everybody loves uh, those lemurs from Madagascar. They're a form of primate. Um, if you just think about for a moment about lemurs, there's, I, I can't remember now, there's like 29 or 30 different species of lemurs. Some of them are fairly significantly different and young earth creationists actually think there might be two or three kinds of lemurs because of their differences. So they might say like there's two or three kinds of lemur types in Madagascar. Well now, then you gotta ask, well, how did they get there? Right, so they had to, you know, there was representatives of the lemurs on the ark. Then they had to travel all the way down the coast of Africa. Then somehow get across the 475 miles or the distance between the the continent and this this island, continent island of of Madagascar. And if there's multiple kinds, they would all have to do that. And the interesting thing about it is if you if you think you ask for details, so I'm going to give you details, right? If you if you, if I were to ask, like, where would you find fossils of Mad of lemurs, and your answer should be, well, maybe in Madagascar. Well, that's right. 
you know, if you wanted to find the fossils of lemurs, of ancient lemurs, of different species of lemurs in the fossil record, in Madagascar, there are fossils of lemurs. Well, in the Young Earth model, the fossils in Madagascar, well, where did they come from? Well, they must have come from the flood, right? Because that's their explanation for the fossil record. So that meant that this little place, this little piece of a continent uh, had lemurs living on it before the flood. Then they got covered over and they got preserved in the, in the fossil record. And, but that's the only place they're found. A lemur fossil has never been found anywhere else. And there's lots of primate fossils from all the other continents. But lemur fossils, no. Only lemur fossils are found in Madagascar. And there's no other primate fossil found in Madagascar at all. So that means, here's, here's the logic. When the lemurs got off the ark, why did they go back to Madagascar where their ancestors were? Uh, why is it necessary to go back to like couldn't they live anywhere <laughs> you know it's like why would they have to go back to that one place and they didn't leave any record on their way right their travels back to madagascar they didn't leave any kind of fossil record which even fossils were formed after the flood young earth creationists acknowledge that so that's just an example of a peculiar we call that a biogeographical problem right there's a particular place in the world that has fossils so it looks continuous like from an old age perspective or a perspective that the world is very ancient and that there wasn't a global flood, that type of data is easy to explain. Remember I said like how the evolutionary framework is a, is a powerful framework for explaining the observations we make in the world. Well, if I observe fossils in a place and then right above them, I see living organisms that are just like the fossils below them, it looks like they've lived there continuously. Right there's their ancestors who got fossilized. Like things happen, and some of them got fossilized, and they continue to live on that island, leaving their ancestors behind. That's a very simple, elegant explanation for the fossil record of of lemurs. Uh, and by the way, that fossil record goes from like different, simpler uh, lemurs, and then it becomes more diverse over time in the fossil record. So that also has the appearance of they evolved there into the different types of lemurs that there are uh, on Madagascar. So then you just take that problem and you just multiply it by, let's say, a thousand times. So I'm not going to do it a thousand different times, but I'll give you one other example. It's the more famous one. What about kangaroos and marsupials in, 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 um, uh, in Australia? Right. They had to have been on the ark, then they would have had to hopped to all the way to, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of that continent, Australia. Yeah, never can remember Australia. They hopped all the way to Australia. And so young earth creationists will respond because they have to have some explanation for this. I was just at the ark encounter. I went to the zoo there and they have a sign there and it has like, how did the kangaroos get from the ark to, to, uh, I just forgot what that continent is, Australia, okay? And, and you can imagine any kid or anybody walking through that, that, um, that park is gonna ask that question, right? I mean, that's just a really classic question. Like, oh, wait a second. Like I know, like I was taught from my, when I was a kid that the only place in the world where there are kangaroos is in, in, in Alaska, Australia. And so how did they get there? And they have two explanations. One is, maybe after the flood three or four hundred years during this giant ice age that they proposed then the oceans were much lower there might have been some land that was uh underneath the ocean that was now above the ocean or above the waters of the ocean and maybe the maybe those kangaroos could have gotten there that way but they will acknowledge that there's some really deep spots so the kangaroos probably couldn't actually hop on land the whole way there so then they propose that Another alternative would be, and this was this was on this is on the sign at the Ark Encounter, that after the flood they proposed that there was massive amounts of like logs that were on the ocean in big patches of old forest because of course before the flood all the forests got torn up and they were in the water and they were you know so they were floating after the flood, and since they're floating maybe the maybe the kangaroos went from Mount Ararat over to like the Red Sea and then they hopped on these floating mats and then they floated all the way to um all the way to what is that continent? Australia. Right? And then they hopped off there and that's how they got there. But 
in a really simplistic sense, like and that's what's in that's what's on the the diagram at the arc encounter. And you could kind of look at it and you say, like, if I just think of it at, at that really big level, like, okay, yeah, there were floating things and there was animals and they could have floated there. It's like all possible. I mean, I mean, you can't say it's impossible. But let me add a little, a couple of added pieces of data that make it harder. One is the same thing I just mentioned with lemurs. If you were to ask where are the fossils of kangaroos, there's lots of fossils of kangaroos in this world. They're all in, they're all in Australia. Like every kangaroo ancestor fossil that we've ever found is in Australia. Uh, the other problem, so that so that raises the specter of it's kind of weird that this flood would like churn up the whole world, lay down all these layers all over the place, but only leave fossils of kangaroos in Australia. And that just happens to be where the all where the where the kangaroos go back to after the flood. Um, it, it takes quite some imagination to figure out a reason why the kangaroos would care about living on top of their ancestors. Um, you know, surely the place was totally different looking, right? It's, it's not like it looked like Australia or had the habitat of Australia uh, before the flood. So, but there's a second problem. And the second problem is that uh, kangaroos aren't the only kind of marsupial. When I look at the Ark Encounter, I see that there's 28 different marsupials that they consider different kinds that are found in Australia and only in Australia. And those all have fossil records there. So it's not just one time this had to happen. Like one time, a king, you know, one kind got off the Ark and then somehow made it the way through this incredible journey, make a great movie, I think. <laughs> the incredible journey going from the Ark all the way to Australia on a floating mat uh, and the adventures they had. But it's not just one time, the kangaroos, you'd have to explain it for the koala bears and for Tasmanian devils and for, you know, I go down the list, right? The 20 different kinds. And so every one of those kinds would have had to have done the same thing and all gone there and none of them ever left a fossil record anywhere outside of Australia. Once again, so a framework that would that accepts the idea that there is a, a long period of time in Earth's history that goes through successive stages uh, of development um, doesn't have any problem with kangaroos being in Australia and having their ancestors in the rocks below them because it just suggests that this is where they have lived for a long period of time and this is where they developed into the kangaroos that they are today. Um, and so that would be, this is one example of looking at two different worldviews and seeing how the data very easily fits an old Earth model versus, say, the, the, the young Earth model. So that's just looking, that's just thinking about uh, like the biogeographic problems, the, the how do organisms move across different places? How did sloths get to just in South Africa or South America, sorry, um, and so forth? Thinking about those marsupials. What's even more striking, maybe, is is you know I was just mentioning that there is 20 or 20 more different kinds of marsupials that all had to go from the ark and all make it together to Australia. They also had to do that to the exclusion of all placental mammals. Now, placental mammals are the ones you're familiar with, um, meaning they don't have that pocket, right? And they just give live they have live birth. And so, if you just think about something like mice, you know, rodents. There's a lot of different kinds of rodents, and rodents are all over the world, but they're not in a, they're not in uh, Australia. Um, they are now, but we also know that humans brought them there probably only in the 1700s. Uh, and so, you know, so it's it's hard to imagine why placental mammals would be excluded from getting to Australia. And so, it, we we can't say that. I mean, young Earth creationists do always have the ad hoc explanation in the very end. Well, that's just the way God planned it. I mean, God directed them to go to one place versus another. Um, but typically, young Earth creationists don't use, they really try to avoid using uh, supernatural explanations for things. Um, because once you once you have one supernatural explanation, you could just say that God just lifted him from the ark and just put him in, you know, put him in Australia, right? And then you can explain everything that way. Uh, and so at that point, it's like, well, why then even have a, why even have an ark, right? God could have just saved him without that. Hmm. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the reasons young Earth creationists don't, they, they really do hold back from trying to like 
insert God into their explanations, which is kind of fascinating, right? Because what they're doing is they're saying, we're looking for natural explanations. We're trying to explain it through science, um, which is kind of ironic you know, that, that, that it ends up being like only natural explanations that they try to use for that. And that's the same thing with speciation. How did, how did two cats or two dogs become, or two canines become all the different canines? They would say natural selection, genetic drift, you know, maybe even a few mutations. Um, in other words, they, they explain all that variation as happening naturally through natural mechanisms, or I'll say God's providential mechanisms, um, rather than any supernatural mechanism. Um, the, other, the other problem is really has to do with human beings. Right when you when you're talking about a global flood four thousand years ago, and you ask the question, intuitively or just maybe what you've learned from about civilizations, is that four thousand three hundred fifty years ago there's a, a quite a bit of evidence that um, humans have were already living in a large portion of the Earth by four thousand three hundred fifty years ago, and so young Earth creationists have to then take the evidence for that and find other explanations for it. Because of course, they, they would say that all living people today are descendants of Noah and his family. And if that's the case, we all share a common ancestor 4,350 years ago, not 6,000 years ago, but actually just 4,350 years ago. And if that's the case, then all these different civilizations that appear to be older than that can't be older than that they have to find their origin sometime after that flood. And so any evidence that suggests they're old has to be reinterpreted in some way. And they can always say that people are biased and we, we don't understand the evidence well, or we're, we're manipulating the evidence so it doesn't look, so it looks older than it really is. But much of it is very common sense type of, of evidence. So I'll just give you a really quick example. Um, if you go down to the Yucatan Peninsula in, in South America, uh, in Mexico, sorry. And there are caves there that are underneath the water. They're under the ocean. And if you go diving in those caves, what you'll find is there's evidence that there was mining operations in those caves and there are actual skeletons of people uh, that died inside of those caves. Uh, and there's all kinds of other animals that are in those caves. They're skeletons, even though they're fully underneath the ocean today. Uh, and so the simplest explanation for their existence is that during the Ice Age, when the oceans were much, much lower, people entered those caves and they made mines for okra to, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, it's a red pigment. And so they mined those things and there's extensive mines inside of those caves. Well, those caves are all underwater. Well, why are they underwater? Because when the ice caps melted, the oceans rose up, flooded all of those caves preserving everything that was inside. So in a young earth, again, in a young earth model, where did the people come from that did all those cave, like, like worked in those caves? They would have had to have come from Noah's Ark, but then you had the Tower of Babel and most young earth creationists also say that everybody, they take it very literally that everybody gathered at Babel. So the entire population of the earth was there. And that's several hundred years after the, the flood. But they would also say that the, the Ice Age happened right after the flood. But, but it's only during the Ice Age that people could have been in these mines all the way over here in, in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. And so people would have had to have traveled all the way across the Bering Strait up in Alaska, all the way down to Mexico, developed a civilization there and had mines there before the apex of the, um, well, before the Ice Age was over with. That's an awful lot of history to pack into just a few hundred years, because that's all they have since they say that the ice age occurred just a few hundred years after the flood. So the, 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 the actual population of the earth and evidence of civilizations in far sprung places is very difficult, very difficult to jive with the young earth creationist model of, uh, of the global flood. Yeah, so you mentioned that there was that young earth creationist proposed an ice age after the flood. Now, you mentioned that we have to have an ice age in general because the water had to melt to be able to get over these caves. So why couldn't the ice age have been before the flood? Yeah, so 
if the ice age had been before the flood, then, oh, well, just think about, like, you just ask yourself the question, where did the caves come from? All right, the caves are in, there's like 5,000 feet of sediment that has fossils in it. And at the okay. very top of all that is a layer of this limestone that that's where the caves formed. So the caves are inside of that top layer of sediment. And so young earth creationists will, will always say, well, those caves are in rock that has fossils in it. So therefore, the rock must have come from the flood. Since the rock came from the flood, the cave mm -hmm. couldn't have existed before the flood. So they have to say, I mean, they're absolutely compelled to say, based on everything else that they, they say about the flood, they are compelled to say that those caves came into existence after the flood. Uh, and then the evidence of the Ice Age might as well fit after the flood, too. Um, had the ice age occurred before the flood, it, the flood would have wiped out all the evidence of any ice age. So any evidence we have of an ice age would not exist uh, in this world today. Um, so that's this oh, is why they they always they always throw in the ice age. And and the reason they do that is because it's kind of irrefutable. I mean, there's so many different places in the world where it's obvious that there was a time in which there was a lot of ice. I mean, I'm living in a place where it was probably covered with ice at one point. Uh, and so since that is, there's a case where the physical evidence of the world is so overwhelming that it kind of doesn't matter how hard it is to fit in. You just have to fit it in. And young earth creationists are just like, okay, well, we have to put it somewhere. So they put it right, like very soon after the flood. Um, and you said that not only that with the whole ice age, but it had to be pretty shortly after. And only that, but the people had to travel from Mount Ararat or whatever yeah. it's called to the what North America? Yeah, all the way down, all the way down Mexico, all the way out to the Yucatan Peninsula, and they probably would have had to have gotten there by going around the Bering Strait, which is where Alaska and uh, the Soviet, well, Russia were connected together during the Ice Age. Mm. So that's called the land bridge that goes between those two continents. Mm -hmm. And, and that, by the way, is the modern theory of where Native Americans came from. They, they came up through uh, Asia, came over the top into Alaska, and then came down all the way down the coast, eventually getting all the way to South America. Um, uh, but they would propose that happened anywhere between 15 to 20,000 years ago. Um, and so like these caves are thought to be about 10 to 15,000 years old. And that would mean that people would have had to have been in them 10 to 15,000 years ago because they've been drowned ever since. Ever since 10,000 years ago, when the ice caps melted, they've been underwater. So can't do anything when they're underwater. Uh, so that's like, it's like seeing a little, like a time capsule. Like you, you go down these caves underneath the water. And it's like, there's like evidence of people. They lived there. They had to have lived there during the ice age. Um, and that's one of the best evidences we have that people lived in North America during the last ice age. So if that only occurred 400 years after the flood at, at its peak and meaning peak, meaning the most ice. So that would have been when people could have moved around. Yeah. People would have had to have moved from Ararat through Babel, left Babel, and then hightailed it all the way across over to Asia, up Asia, across Alaska, down the coast of California down Mexico to Yucatan. Hmm. Um, and it's not like I've seen young earth creationists say, well, that's possible because, you know, they could walk this many miles per day. And then if they did that for like a year, you know, you, they could do it. They could get there. I'm like, but how many people, you know, just set out and like, I'm going to walk, you know, 10,000 miles and then I'll settle down. Especially when you're walking through all of Asia where there's no other people. It's like, why not just settle there? You know, it's like there's so many places along the way that, that are like mm -hmm. so much nicer. That why do you continue to push yourself to go to like the end of the world when you don't have to? Um, so it it doesn't really make sense that that people could get there that fast. Hmm. Um, and it's not just a few people; it would be thousands of people. You know, have to be there. And at the same time, there's evidence in Florida, uh, off the by the way, off the coast of Florida. They have found hunting camps underneath the ocean. Um, and that's when the, the coast was lower. The Native Americans in the Floridians uh, lived where the ocean is now. 
Um, and all of those had to have also lived there. And there's also evidence that people uh, lived underneath the uh, Lake Huron in, uh, in the Great Lakes uh, when those lakes were much lower as well. So that's a, that's a lot of evidence that people were in North America during the most recent ice age. Um, and that's a, that's a really hard fact because it is a fact, I, I think. You might say the, the dating of that might not be a fact, that's interpretation, but the presence of people there, that's pretty much a fact that they were there. And so any model, anybody's, anybody's view of world history has to accommodate those facts. And that's kind of what we're all dealing with, right? We deal with that every day. It's like, there are things in this world that we see and observe that we have to find a way to understand. Uh, and we have to fit, you know, we know we would say that the Bible is a true and accurate depiction of what it intends to preach and teach. And if it intends to teach the history of man as being only 4,000 years old, um, then we'd have to find a way to mesh those two things, those observations and that ev and that biblical evidence as well. Yeah, totally. Uh, that's so a, that's a, you yeah. asked me, what are the challenges for young earth creationism? And I would say that's, that's a really big challenge for them. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that they are going to have trouble answering. Not that everybody doesn't have challenges, right? I, I don't think you or I would say that we have all the answers or that there isn't something out there that we are like, I don't know how to, you know, I see this and I think, believe this, but I also see this other evidence. And I don't know how it fits together. We all have, we all have challenges. Um, it's kind of, you know, we're all trying to minimize our challenges to find the best, the best understanding uh, of the world we live in. Yeah, totally. So kind of on that subject. Um, so, so you talk about all these like, you know, scientific terms and like, all these different situations in history and like, you know, the common person just doesn't have <laughs> or the interest or the time most likely to look at all these different types of things. You know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a historian either. I'm just some, some random guy in the street. So, so on the other hand, so you have that, but you also have like, you know, Christians that, that love, they accept like what the Bible says. They think it's true. And, you know, they, they see the, see the, the Bible and they think that, you know, it's 6,000 years old and that, you know, the flood happened 4,000 years ago. And they say, okay, I don't understand exactly what happened in between these and like how we got all these different species and how the ice age happened and all these other things, but I'm going to yeah. trust God. And it just seems like it's 6,000 years old. And I don't know, even know much about science. So like, and I can't, I don't even know if I can even understand science. So like, why can't I just trust the Bible? That's a great question. And at the end of the day, I'm actually fine with somebody saying, this is the, you know, this to me is the most obvious interpretation of, of the text, right? I look at it as God created in six days. And I hear people saying that that's a good interpretation and it, and it reads true to me. Yeah. So God said it, I believe, you know, I believe it. Um, you know, one one thing about that phrase when I see when I hear people say that, which is sort of the connotation that that, that you're suggesting there, is that you know it it assumes that we're for one thing it assumes we're perfect interpreters, right? Um, but we're you know we're fallible, and so I think we do need to have some humility uh, in terms of our interpretation, which which kind of brings me to the idea that for those who just want to say I just believe the world is young, that's the simplest way to go. That's just what I've been taught. This is the things that I hear in my church. Um, so wh why are you bothering me with this, right? Why are we talking about this? Why am I watching this conversation about it, right? Um, I would say that, you know, you can live your life like that. You can live with that. I don't think it, it's not going to like change some essential doctrine or, you know, it, it, you know I don't think God's going to say, well, you were wrong about that. And, you know, the gates of hell, you know, heaven are going to be closed on you because that's not what salvation is about. And um, so it's all right to live with what I'm going to call error. I think I think it's an erroneous view. I don't think it's the best view, best interpretation, both of scripture and of science. But at the end of the day, it kind of doesn't matter that much, you know, for, for your for for your life. However, I will add that 
if for those who just want to say, just throw their hands up and are like, you know, I'm just going to believe this. This is the easiest thing for me to do. And I don't want to think about that too much. Is you really have to be careful not to be dogmatic about it then. You can't say like, this is the truth. Like I know, because if you haven't actually like said to yourself, oh, I'm going to try to actually understand the science. I'm going to try to, I'm going to do some reading. I'm going to listen to a variety of experts. I'm going to listen to a variety of different positions. Oh, remember we talked about, you know, we have talked about a little bit about becoming brainwashed, just, you know, being fed something maybe from only one particular, um, one particular viewpoint. And you may trust that viewpoint, but if you haven't actually experienced the, in, the data itself, if you haven't actually like done your own research in today's favorite word uh, in social media, if you haven't actually done the hard work to establish your own thinking on this, and that can be guided by you know the greats of you know theologians and so forth really helping you through this, then you really shouldn't turn around and tell people, well, you're going to hell because you believe the world is millions of years old, or you know the, the lighter version of that. Well, you're just ignorant, or you're biased, or you you you're brainwashed, right? You're you went to a secular college and they taught you this, and 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 that's completely wrong. Um, so, I, you know, I can say that. I, I'll never say that I absolutely know that I'm right because I could be wrong. I'm fallible as well. But I do know one thing. I have spent an enormous amount of time you know, thinking about this, right? I've spent 20 years. I've read, I have collections of many, many, many different books. I've had discussions with many different people. I've approached this from many different angles. And so I'm comfortable with a what I think is a high view of scripture and a, and a real serious a real a serious way of looking at and acknowledging that scripture is the most important and infallible rule of how we how we understand God and this world um, and have found a balance with that and his creation which he also made right and it's also a witness to him and I think the two should be consistent you know they should be sending the same messages um, and I think that there are interpretations. There are there are there are valid frameworks for understanding the scripture that, in my mind, bring even greater glory to God than a very simple, I'll say, wooden interpretation of Genesis one, where it's sort of like, oh, what's Genesis one about? Well, it's about how God made things in six days. Um, it's like if that's all you got out of it, then you've missed a lot of the richness of Genesis one because it's telling a lot of messages about who God is and it's telling a lot of messages about why he's done or why he's done what he's done what the purpose of these things in creation are he's setting up things for how we understand the world around us um, and you don't have to have an interpretation of the world as young in order to get all that tremendous richness out of it in other words you can you can learn a lot about God and who he is and I think what the author intended us to learn about God and who he is can all be taught without having to constrain ourselves to this is about six days. Like that's the most important message uh, that we would get from that. Um, yeah, so God could have, you know, done, he could, could have created in six days. And um, it, does, it, does it matter? It may or may not matter, but I'm also interested in, in the truth, right? I, I, I think we should, as his creatures, one of the things that we're here on earth doing, right, is we're living in communion with each other, but we're also bringing greater glory to God. He, I, I go back to something I said earlier about, you know, the, the, the garden, right, and being placed in his presence. And then have we fulfilled obeying him there, the ideas of spreading the garden in terms of the way that that, that garden interacted, the, the ecology of the garden, how, in, how everything interacted in that garden was very good. And we had a job to tend it and keep it, to protect it and watch over it. Uh, we still have that job. And we're here to do what? Glorify and enjoy God. Well, how do we glorify and enjoy God? One of the things we do to glorify God is, as his creatures, 
is we, as we understand and explore and discover new things about his creation, aren't we glorifying God, right? We, you know, when I, when, when somebody discovers something new and describes God's creation, in a way, descriptions, oh, remember what Adam did? Remember Adam was told to name the animals? And I think people have a very wooden char characterization of what that was. Like they see him just sitting on the side of a hill and God sort of prances these animals past him and he goes, that's a lion, that's a dog, that's a, you know, a coyote, that's a, you know, and just sort of names them off. But in Hebrew and in understanding the, the world of the Hebrews in, in ancient Near East, naming things is like an, an act of understanding their purpose in this world. And you don't just like know that. That's something you explore and figure out. And the idea of naming would be that he's giving Adam the job of understanding his world around it, organizing that world, giving it names and purposes. And what did God do in Genesis 1? He organized the world or the universe, and he created the basic parts of that universe. And But most importantly, he's giving function or names to like what they're responsible for, the lights governing seasons and so forth. Um, and so what Adam's doing is he is being given that role. And that's what makes man made in God's image, not the other animals, is we have the capacity to actually understand this world that God has made and actually be involved in the process of continuing to order and name things and understand his creation. So, you know, the, the non the non-scientists or the non-Christian can discover things about this world. And I think in a sense that even when non-Christians discover new things about the world, like looking through telescopes and seeing vast universes far away, and they are amazed by the size and the grandeur of the universe, I think in a way they are, they are bringing glory to God and they're magnifying God in that way, but not the same way Christians do, right? Because a Christian has a relationship with God and understands who his creator is. And when he examines, he or she examines this world and makes discoveries, they are bringing a type of glory to God that far exceeds what anything else in God's creation can do. So to bring this all back, right? Because you, I mean, you started with the question of like, oh, you know, this is hard stuff and why can't I just accept 4,000 years? I think that you're missing out on something much better. It's kind of like becoming a Christian and then saying, you know, I just I just want you to give me like a little guidebook, right? Here's the do's and don'ts and do these things, don't do these things. And I don't want to think about hard topics, right? I, um, but hard topics are are the way, well, any topic really that we explore and try to understand God better and what he, expect, what he expects of us, but also how we are to live in this world and commune with each other. Anything that we're doing in that area is bringing more glory to God. And it is, it is allowing us to become, to understand God better, right? It's deepening our relationship. And so if you just sort of, I don't want to think about this topic. I don't want to think about science. Well, you're, you're kind of saying, I don't want to think about the world God made. I don't want to think about you know what what god has done you know in this world and so i think you're just miss i i don't think it's wrong i, I just think you're 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 shortchanging yourself by doing that and not exploring those issues but not everyone's going to be an expert i i understand that but i would just go back again to if you if you just going to say that's my belief then you can't Mm, I, I, you can't be super dogmatic and accuse all other Christians who maybe really do spend a lot of time thinking about this topic. Can't accuse them of being heretics and don't know what they're talking about, and they have to be wrong. Um, I reserve the ability to do that only for those who really have spent a lot of time actually thinking about it. Would you say that when you're talking about, like, you know, put, actually putting the effort in, that would also include? looking at like basically like all views um for example um you know some people they're super confident in the bible not because they haven't put the effort in or and they're okay with that with not putting the effort in 
to looking into the science because they just feel so confident in what the Bible says. Yeah, that's. I think that's fair. To, I, well, I think that's a fair thought. What I'll say is that um, I have to be careful how I say this. I want to say that the Bible's not enough. I, you know, the Bible's enough, but it's enough to understand who God is, who we are as his creatures, where we fall short, and what we need, right, for for salvation. Um, and you know, so we know his, we know God's character through scriptures and who he is and expectations. But I don't think that if you didn't understand, if you just blocked off the rest of the world around you and said, I don't want to understand science. And I always say science is just understanding the creation. It's understanding the, the, the physical component of God's world. Uh, if you don't understand creation at all, in a way, you're also shortchanging yourself with on the ability to understand the scriptures. I mean, because people live in the world and the authors of the Bible are interacting in a world which is a physical creation. And you need to understand that physical creation. creation. And that would include, in this case, ancient Near East culture and, and so forth is a very important aspect of understanding how people thought in order to be able to in, properly interpret the scriptures. Right? You can say, like, well, I've, I've really studied the scriptures, but if you study them just by yourself, um, oh, yeah, let's go back to, like, how do you know you haven't just talked yourself into an idea um, and you've fallen into your own trap, your own brainwashed version of an interpretation? You always do have to test it, right? You have to, and that testing can be other Christians who have also thought through the same script passages, right? And so they're tempering, you know, the steel with each other. And, but it also could be, look, there's scientists who you don't have to understand the scientists, but you could listen to a scientist who has thought a lot about this topic and has, has been interacting with it and get their thoughts on it and at least appreciate the scope of, of these things. Um, Genesis 1 and 2 has been a problematic text. Well, first 11 chapters of Genesis uh, have been a problematic test for, you know, people all the way back to the first century. So I don't think any of us should feel like, oh, this is easy. <laughs> you, know, it's like, I don't, you know, Luther and Calvin both remarked how difficult uh, it was to interpret these passages um, in their fullness. So yeah. we don't want to be don't want to be arrogant in our in our in our interpretations. Mm. Yeah, which I I could go into a whole other subject. I was thinking about like <laughs> arrogant and closed-minded as far as Christianity goes in general. But, yeah, you know, but I'm also not one to just say like, oh, you should go out there and explore all. You know, it's like I wouldn't say like you should go out and explore other religions or you know, I it, there is there is there is a safe way to do things, mm -hmm. right, and a rational way to explore ideas, and then there's a dangerous way to do, it, which is simply immerse yourself in others indiscriminately because there mm -hmm. are really really bad ideas based on really bad philosophy, and and sometimes and and again, that's where knowing assumptions of different models of of christian models of, of theistic models not just of creation but um different branches of christianity have different philosophical assumptions and if you understand those then you have some idea of why people are thinking the way they're thinking and if you can eliminate particular things well you can eliminate particular religions because of their inconsistency right with, with the god of the bible then you can rationalize not listening to certain voices. And that's what you have to do, because otherwise you'd have a billion voices around you speaking all the time. It'd be terribly confusing. It's hard to make decisions. We do all, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to trust some sources at some point. The, the important thing is to, to, to identify what are trustworthy sources. Yeah, so, I mean, that's all I got for you. Um, any, any, any other last thoughts? Yeah, I think that's a good introduction. <laughs> go out, go check out Joel's channel. <laughs>